Celsius 2 Squadron, this is the radar at Ramsgate. Can you hear me? This is CS2 Squadron, what is it? We believe to have spotted a probe just a couple of miles off the coast. Please have a look. Over and out. You heard the man, CS22. Swoop down to Angel 0 0.5. See if we can spot something in contrast with the clouds. Copy CS21, but uh, one simple question. Wouldn't that make us sitting ducks down there? Yes. It would. Still not like I can see much. We'll hello to these chaps first. Climb back up after that. Good fires, George. Greatest plane ever built. Didn't even look. Rolls Royce Merlin engines. Sweetest sound you could hear out here. And at 11 o'clock. Oh. Talk to me, Goose. I think you've got the wrong movie, but he's on me. I'm on him. Hold still, CS22. On my mark, draw him left. Three, two, one. Mark! Clear. Have you got him? Is he down? Yeah, he's down for the count. World War II's Battle of Britain happened nearly 80 years ago. And from that battle, two particular aircraft used by the Royal Air Force stand out to me. The Hawker Hurricane and the Supermarine Spitfire. You might be asking yourself where I'm going with this and what it has to do with the Planet Eclipse GOCS-2. And to get the full picture, we have to look at the ETHA-2-2. There are some engineering differences and design choices that went behind these planes that, that really made me think of some very interesting connections that these two markers have with the paintball industry very oddly. Basically, the Hurricane was really easy to mass produce using a combination of steel, wood, and cloth skin. And even though they were really tough, if one was damaged in battle, all you really needed to get it back in the air was a carpenter, some wood, cloth and paint. The Aether 2, a marker pretty much based off of a GRN construction. So all of this stuff is molded. There's a few aluminum parts like the ASA and body and obviously the internals. Uh, fairly simple aluminum body though. So yeah, these are intended for mass production, especially this EMEC version in intended for rental use. The Supermarine Spitfire was a much more complex design for the time. It used what we know as a monocoque structure, where the all-metal fuselage was both the skeleton and the skin. It was very slim, maneuverable, fast, and pilots say, even to this day, that they fly beautifully. And I think they're beautiful machines as well, even 72 times smaller. It's just a legendary aircraft. But, compared to the Hurricane, these were much more expensive, and you could build three of these in the same time it took you to build one of these. And it's a similar set of differences with the CS2, because this is all milled aluminum, which is a better finish, but also comes with the extra production cost, which goes without saying. Uh, they're slimmer and pointlessly more aerodynamic. Pointless because unlike the Spitfires, these were never intended to fly. And while they don't fly like the Spitfire, the fit and finish on these markers is as close to perfect as you can humanly get. The machining has an expert finish down to the CS2 branding at the rear of the spine, which is neatly complemented by the serial number at the center, these being milled into the body, not laser engraved, but milled. And this kind of detail, even though small, is really special. 
Now the body itself blends seamlessly with everything else. The front grip flows into the eye covers, which flow into the body, which is one with the frame and its grips, and combined with the starburst styling at the bonnet, inspired by the original Eclipse logo by the way, this Cosmic CS2 looks absolutely stellar. The black can still be inspiring too. both the Spitfire and the Hawker, no that's Harry Kane, I'm talking about the Hawker Hurricane. <laughs> both the Spitfire and the Hurricane. <laughs> this is a Gamma Core from an Etha 2 and this is the Gamma Pro from the CS2. And where I'm going with this is basically like in both the Spitfire and the Hurricane, there are major external differences, but also some pretty significant internal ones as well. These are both the Gamma platform. We'll get to what makes the Gamma really special later. But aside from the same operating principle and essentially the same action, just more refined here, you've also got regulators, electronics layout, air path, battery, eyes, a whole bunch of stuff that is extremely similar in both the CS2 and the Etha 2. In terms of strategy, the differences between the Spitfires and Hurricanes made sense. The RAF had a larger fleet of Hurricanes that could swarm bombers to shoot them down, while the Spitfire, with its terrific maneuverability and high speed, would intercept the enemy fighters escorting them. Horses for courses, my friends. A workhorse in the Hurricane to take care of those pesky bombers causing a lot of trouble, and a racehorse in the Spitfire to go head-to-head -head with the best the best aircraft the enemy had to throw at you. Throw. Do it. Do it now. Throw. I would also say that the markers in plane sort of parallel as well when it comes to purpose or roles. The Etha 2 and now the Emex, I think are one of the preferred markers when it comes to big games and, and just recreational play. It's an inexpensive gun that tons of players are equipping. Some fields already have a fleet of 100 Emex. That's crazy. So when it comes to the workhorse and the Eclipse lineup, by definition, this Etha 2 and Emec platform is most definitely that, a workhorse. The CS2, on the other hand, is a competition marker. It's built for competition. The guys that are gonna be using these are pros and other tournament players who are gonna go head to head with their rivals, dump hundreds of thousands of rounds by the time they replace these markers. And that's basically it. These markers, the CS2s, are built for tournament paintball. They're built for competition. They're the racehorse in the Eclipse lineup. The main idea is that in regard to the CS2, you are correct to ask, why does it look like a high-end Etha 2? Because first, let's get it out of the way. That's actually a good thing. And second, I think that was the point. The Etha 2 is terrific and definitely one of the top three markers of last year. So to see its best features in a marker purpose-built for competition paintball, is to see the faces of the paintball gods and feeling their embrace. Speaking of competition paintball, we now have three pro-level markers from Planet Eclipse, and they're all quite different. Early in the lineup, we've got the LV 1.5. This particular example of the LV is an LVR, possibly my favorite marker in my collection. These things have been around since 2013. They shoot amazingly well. They're extremely reliable and robust, and possibly my favorite marker in paintball still. Now, it is a bit old, so you still have an AT pipe. It's not entirely hoseless. There is a wired connection between frame and body. 
You need an Allen key to remove the eye covers and the trigger is a one, in, one entire piece. It doesn't have the shoe adjustment. And still, like I said, these markers are just absolutely incredible. And I love this one. Next, we have the CS1 family. This particular example is a CSR. These markers have won everything. They've got the IV core. They're very efficient. They're moderately reliable compared to the LV and the CS2. They're not as reliable, but they're still pretty reliable. And to me, they're the most comfortable gun in paintball. Now, the IV core shot isn't my favorite. It's a little hissy for my taste and a little swooshy, but some guys absolutely love that. Still, like I said, children with small hands will disagree with me, but this marker is just incredible in the hands. And then there's the big bad behemoth that we're looking at now. The Planet Eclipse Geo CS2. This stellar example, pun intended, is my buddy Jeremy's Cosmic CS2. Uh, he, lent, he wanted me to show it off this video, so I am, and I think it looks fantastic. This marker is incredibly high-tech. We're gonna look into all of it, but let's just shoot it for now, and it does shoot great. Obviously, we now have to ask, what makes it shoot so well? The G-Tech really started it all with the Gamma Cord. Still one of the best pointing guns in paintball. It proved to be unbeatable in terms of reliability and, and just a really well-performing marker. And it stood tall alongside the E-Tech 5 in the mid-range marker market. And after that, it's just taken, taken the Eclipse lineup by storm, essentially. Everything has uh, a gamma core now, sort of like the RAF with Merlin engines. It's, it's kind of funny that I made that analogy earlier in the video I'm doing it. Anyway, but with the EMEC as a rental, the ETHA 2 as an entry level, the GTEC as a mid-range marker, the 160R as a bridge marker, and the CS2 as a high-end tournament pro-level marker, all well, the gamma cores and everything. At least everything spool valve. But that question's still lingering. Why is the CS Line's IV core action, the legendary IV core, being overtaken by what's effectively the same action found in a rental marker? To answer that, I'd argue that the Gamma in its original form was always a high-end drivetrain. I even mentioned that back in, what, 2016? These are pretty much high-end drivetrains. And maybe the guys at Eclipse didn't realize how good of an engine they actually had until they were considering options for the CS2. And frankly, I don't think it could have been any other way. But a marker is so much more than just the drivetrain, so I promise we'll go really in-depth on the Gamma Pro later. But in the meantime, let's run some drills and get some good trigger time. I just what I like, and I like. 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 First thing I have to say is that the marker joyfully takes you by the hand in a melt facing ride along the field. Or a face melting ride along the field. Its ergos and handling are on point. The textured rubber grips make switching hands a quick and easier deal. No slippery metal, no hard parts, just a big grippy front grip, which is terrific. The marker is also lightweight. It certainly makes no big deal out of running, sliding, and gunfighting. Those actions feel extremely natural with the CS2. Laning performance is good too, but the light setup might feel a bit bouncy for some, so I would suggest using a heavy metal barrel if you want an absolutely perfect laning setup. Now, toughness. This one's a pretty big deal considering how some of the very early production CS1s weren't very reinforced when it comes to the frame at the front. If you took a bad dive, you would bend them downwards. What they did to correct this issue with the CS1s was just add a reinforcement pin to connect the frame and the body, but with the CS2, They've taken this a step further and made the frame itself slide into the body. So there's some more rigidity and it's, it's a lot tougher. And this one just won't bend. And the shot, God, <laughs> blind me, it's delicious.
It feels like just a release. Sort of, the shot begins, happens, and stops. You don't... it has no finish. Okay. What I mean by saying that the shot only feels like a release is that it just goes bang. You don't really get a swooshy hint of bolt movement for build up or a tingy sensation in the front grip for the finish. It's just bang and done. And I'm gonna bring it up because I know it's coming in the comments as it has in almost every single CS2 video, but the sound. The marker is not as loud in person as it seems to be in video. Just check out how much of the sound is being drowned out by the bunker when I'm shooting behind it. Further, the claim that the CS2 is a loud marker just simply isn't true. You saw me shooting this behind the bunker and heard how the sound was being drowned out. That's not something that happens with a loud marker. And yeah, it isn't hissy like the CS1, but really the CS1 was hissy because the SFR was venting out the frame and you heard that. That's, what the, that's where the hiss came from. But we'll get to that later. Watch this. Normally we'd sit at my tech mat to take apart markers and well we could have done that with the CS2. I really want to take do this outside because the CS2 is very field strippable I guess you could say which isn't necessarily new actually it isn't new but the CS2 does it so well I might as well just point it out. Just get ready for a lot of clicking starting with the Gamma Pro's click also to get to your eyes it's click you just take this out, wipe off your eye cover to clean your eyes because you've got the light pipe, which is a terrific system. Click to lock it back on. And you've got your battery system, which is two double A's. And you could just do this the layman's way and just go whoop, which is boring in my opinion. You've got to do this the, tr the time crisis way. Time got crisis. The batteries in like this. And then when the cue comes, Reload! Then you turn your gun on. Hear that? So it worked. It did power on. It works the exact same way for the grips. Click, click. You just rip these apart, really. It's easy as cake. And you hardly ever need to get here. I, I, realistically, if you're the average user, you won't get in here. So if you'd like a different set of grips, like the CS1 grips, which are a little bit chunkier and I find them more comfortable, you could have those on. You have to screw them on, but since you'd really never have to access this, it doesn't really matter. But I just really like the toolless design. I prefer having toolless. That's why you see me using these grips on this one. Now, I'll take these back off, click, click. Something that always clicks now is your trigger because there's no opto switch, which is a huge bummer for me because I'm an opto switch guy. And last but not least, you've got the click of the pops. Uh, I don't know about anyone who dislikes the pop system. It's just, it's a really well done, really simple ASA solution. Double click to power on and click, bang. Still really bummed about there not being an opto switch. Speaking of the trigger, you know me, I don't really like blade triggers that much. So props to Eclipse for getting an S-style trigger in my hand so soon. The S trigger is just something I had to do. It automatically makes me 20% cooler and gosh, it just, it just feels really good when you get on it. I used the rake adjustment to send it forward a couple of millimeters. That's about 78 thous for you Imperials. And it feels terrific with the new spring and magnet arrangement for tension. The idea with this new setup is that you adjust the trigger around the activation point instead of vice versa. But here's my argument about the opto switch. If we had an opto switch instead of a micro switch, we would have been able to do both. I'll spare you my rant. Just join me in this moment of remembrance for our opto switch. Our friend, our ally, our deliverer, shunner of foul deeds, slayer of evil, 
valiant warrior of solenoid activation, we will not have forgotten you by the end of this fateful strife. As a matter of fact, the CS2 is a beast because it takes the best bits and pieces from the Ego and Geo and combines them for the best of both worlds while keeping things simple. Look, it's just easy. Everything about this marker is easy. It's easy to take to the field, it's easy to shoot, it's easy to take apart, it, most of it's toolless as you've seen. Ugh. The guys on the Facebook PSTs can actually use these. And to add to the stuff that we've already looked at, the stuff we're going to look at next is even easier. And only when you go deep into disassembly is when you'll need your allen keys to remove a grand total of four screws before you entirely take this thing apart. Four. The board zuh, and I say zuh because there's two of them, one running along the body inside the frame and the other one inside the grip frame where your usual Eclipse boards are. They're a bit slower. That's off. That's on. I do miss the speed of the older Eclipse boards. You can hear the tones a little different too, but they're slower because they're, they're just loading a lot more stuff. They're loading a bunch of presets. They're loading more splash screen data because you can actually animate these now. And it's just that sort of thing. It's the same stuff, just more of it, if that makes sense. But one nice addition is the use of Bluetooth low energy, just for the future. Uh, I talked to Flash about it, Flash over at Eclipse, and he said, yeah, we included the Bluetooth low energy just in case there ever is a zombie apocalypse or Skynet takes over. You can reprogram the marker in through your phone to overtake Skynet or to slay some zombies. But since we're talking paintball right now, there's not much adjustment you're gonna need. Just maybe change your mode to, to whatever you're playing and maybe the, the LCD color. Let's say you like chartreuse, uh, you can, Definitely have chartreuse on here. Make the LCD chartreuse. But other than that, you don't need to touch a thing. This thing is dwell insensitive. Don't touch the dwell. Don't ever have to. You don't touch anything. The GP is already self-timed. And speak of the GP, we'll get to it. <laughs> Like I mentioned before, to me it was clear, it couldn't have been any other way. This was the obvious step for the Geo to take, even if it appears to be a complete departure from the legendary IV core at first glance. So while it is indeed a massive departure from the traditional air sear Geo core like the IV, it's still the natural progression of the Geo philosophy, always intended to be reliable and always intended to have some insensitivity to dwell. The ISSIS valve in the first Geo shut the inlet via the solenoid, so you wouldn't need a long and heavy bolt that would suffer from stiction and compromise reliability to achieve that. The Geo 2 brought a sprung prop shaft to the equation, trapping around 5 psi after each shot, but most importantly closing the valve before the dwell expires. The Geo 3 simply introduced the SFR. When the GSL was introduced with the IV core, the ground shook violently because instead of saving 5 PSI with a sprung prop shaft, you're saving about 40 PSI with a reactive prop shaft. It senses breach pressure and reacts off of it, which produces a massive efficiency gains. And it's one of the reasons the 3.5 platform is held so fondly. When the CS1 came along, a couple of major changes were made. First was the increase in volume of the valve chamber so you could slow down the bolt even more and make the shot softer and lower force, that sort of thing, natural progression. And the other major change was the solenoid. The CS1 started using an in-house design for the solenoid with an SMC pilot as opposed to the mag valve solenoids. The mag valve solenoids were incredibly fast acting and pretty high performance, but they had the Achilles heel of not being user serviceable. So the guys at Eclipse scratch their heads and think, we really need a serviceable solenoid. So they get rid of the mag valve solenoids and, and make their own, base, they basically make their own and connect to an SMC pilot. Well, the SMC pilot is much slower than the mag valves was. So combine this lower solenoid actuation with the lower valve pressure and you've got a slower bolt and in extreme cases, some pretty ridiculous bolt stick, even with a stock dwell time of 27 milliseconds. So naturally, the GP has kept all the good things from the Geo and ditched any potential disadvantages. Now, there is a price we pay, and that is a more complex system with more O-rings. 
but I think it's worth the trade. With the components being decoupled, what you basically end up with is an action that is self-timed. And what that means is that the components create domino effects that cause the other components to, to go to work. And the advantages of a system like this that finishes the cycle in its own time are probably more than I can name. The bolt completely cycles forth and back before the dwell time expires because it has been separated from the solenoid. Now, the bolt's bias depends on whether or not the bolt guide is plugged by the firing poppet slash spool or not. It's almost identical in shape to the LV-1 poppet, so picture the actuation of a CS2 as an LV-1 shot inside it. So there's plenty of force pushing that bolt forward. Kind of like how a hydrogen bomb's actuator is an atomic bomb. Picture the exact same thing going on in here, except at a smaller scale and without the destruction and death. But aside from that, it's basically the same thing. There's a few other advantages to having the bolt return when you have a bolt sailing based on the position of the spool. First, when the IV core-like breach sensing bit actuates, it shuts the bolt guide. In effect, the bolt returns. So before the dwell time expires, the bolt is back, and there's already a ball settled in the breach ready to fire. That means many things, but in short, it's just a very blatant representation of the Planet Eclipse design philosophy. The general idea of mechanically making the user experience plug and play or idiot proof if you prefer. If the marker can cycle faster than its dwell, there's obviously a huge rate of fire benefit. More importantly, it helps a lot with paint handling, especially at 10.5 NXL. There's plenty of time for the next ball in the stack to settle in the breach. Even though the offset feed neck already does a pretty good job of helping the ball settle. Those benefits occur thanks to the lightning fast bolt return because the forward stroke itself is actually really slow. Obviously to soften up the shot and, and to help with paint handling, which this marker does phenomenally. The guys at Eclipse obsess over paint handling. Just check this out. I've got three balls in the stack without a feed tube and that is an easy ride for the ball stack. But I'm getting distracted. The main benefit we get from this system is reliability. Because there is a shift in pressure instead of an air sear being vented, all 105 PSI from the valve chamber push against the bolt when it's in rest, and when you fire, all 105 PSI are pushing forward, albeit at a controlled rate. So it's coming forward slowly to clear the valve slowly, pushing the paintball down the breech slowly, but with all 105 PSI from the valve chamber, unlike the air sear system, that had some resistance as the air sear was being vented out. Think of an air sear bolt as a high speed object being slowed down by a brake and think of the GP core bolt as an independent object advancing at its own pace. The gamma action is also more reliable because the bolt sails independently from the solenoid. So any excess grime built up in the bolt just gets shoved out of the can. Where in an air sear design, all that stuff would just build up in the can, or worse, get vented through the solenoid. The proof is in the peanut butter. These markers don't go down to lack of maintenance. So all in all, this is the same gamma platform blow forward air spring return system in the GP core. But the refinements like the larger volume chamber and drop in pressure, the shortening of the switch throw, the soft face bolt for ridiculously brittle paint, all these things make the GP more like a Griffin engine in a Griffin Spitfire, as opposed to the Merlin. With all that said, it's hard to think of a design I personally like more for competition right now. I love my LVR, I have over a hundred thousand rounds through it and it has been the perfect performer. I even like the LVR's performance more, but it lacks the straightforward simplicity of the CS2's disassembly and massive convenience of the toolless features. Remember, paintball is a game that you play. The marker is only there to do what you tell it to do, but thankfully, this is one of those markers that disappears in your hands and lets you focus on playing. The only thing you ever need to adjust is your velocity and firing mode, obviously. But other than that, just pick it up and, and go play. Pew, 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 pew.
that's a wrap on the CS2 video. Fun fact, this project was over 200 gigabytes, so I'm really happy to finally be done with it. It took a lot, a lot, a lot of time to make. Uh, I know I kept a lot of you guys waiting, but hopefully this was worth it. Makes me really happy to see you guys come back for every video, get excited about paintball. It's my favorite part, just keeping people talking about paintball, living, breathing, <sighs> going crazy about paintball. I yeah, absolutely love it. I want to thank you guys for your viewership. I want to thank everyone who gives beyond viewership even more. Uh, yeah, and uh, hopefully I'll see you guys sooner rather than later next time.